they could erupt if they have reason to do so. One of the reasons would be if they don't have money to buy food to feed their families. There won't be a factory in America that's able to keep its accounts in order. How do you budget when you don't know the value of the currency with which you're budgeting? How do you make a payroll when you don't know the value of what you're paying out to your employees? There can only be one result, and that is shut down. While all that's going on, the local and state governments have an erosion of their tax base because of the, the uh, absence of profits in that sector and so on. So you'll have less budget for services. So the police and what have you will have less capability to deal with the growing unrest. You've got the makings for major civil disorder. In the past where this has happened, you have emerging out of that chaos, um, first of all, a deep quest for order. As people really begin to experience the anarchy, there'll be a deep quest for order and they will tolerate emergency measures that they normally wouldn't. And this is what happened in Germany, which eventually planted the seeds for the rise of Hitler. Uh, in this country, who knows? But um, uh, all kinds of emergency measures will, of course, be empowered to try to deal with these things, and that will empower, in effect, a, a total loss of our personal freedoms. We're seeing ourselves set up for, for not just uh, a political and military global control, a dictatorship, if you will, but also absolute control financially, economically. Uh, we've seen this done in the Soviet Union, other, other communist nations, where when somebody doesn't play the game, he simply has his worker's card withdrawn, canceled. He can't do business. He can't get a job. He can't support his family. That's all it takes to make a man completely helpless. Projections could go on and on as to what life in America would be like after the fall. But perhaps the greatest psychological adjustment for the citizen to make will be to see America stepping down as a world power and at the mercy of foreign investors. The uh, economic peril that we're in right now is already eroding our leverage on the world scene. About 30% of our debt is foreign held, and already our policies are increasingly dictated by the holders of that debt. I take risk with other people's money. I have the ability to convert their dollars into any other foreign currency that I choose. It's a sad state on our economy when the American dollar is possibly the worst investment around. Who would want to own the American dollar and invest in a country whose government has shown year after year that it does not respect its own economy enough to balance its own budget? The alarm is sounding and the hour is late. Every responsible citizen who is willing to do whatever it takes to turn the tide and save our country for tomorrow and future generations wants to know what can be done. I think it takes a major change in attitude on the part of every American. Number one, to, get, to take this problem seriously, to hold their uh, elected representatives accountable, and to insist upon major changes, major changes. The time has come for a second American Revolution. I'm not talking about one with guns, but at the ballot box. I sincerely believe that if we Americans don't change who controls the Congress of the United States, we will have lost the opportunity to save this nation from national bankruptcy. We need to identify the big spenders in the Congress, whether Democrat or Republican, and give them the retirement they richly deserve. I think it's very important to make noise when you see a politician supporting spending legislation. There are a number of uh, taxpayer groups that rate members of Congress, and uh, you can get a hold of those ratings and look at whether somebody is uh, voting with the taxpayers or against them on a regular basis. Writing to members of Congress is not a fruitless exercise. It really does matter. People need to read. They need to educate themselves. And once they've educated themselves, they've got to get a hold of their congressman and wring his neck if necessary. Because the one thing that a congressman will respond to is an enraged populace. I believe there are some prudent things that everybody should be doing. The first thing is to get yourself out of debt because whatever you owe for, given the wrong kind of an economy, potentially belongs to somebody else. So you can lose everything you have. And it doesn't matter how much you have, you can lose it. On a personal level, the wisest thing that any of us can do, irrespective of our station in life, is strive to the best that we can to get out of debt. 
Not easy to do in a consumer society because the pressure to spend is everywhere around us. Lower your cost of living, use the difference to get out of debt, then if you have a surplus, that gives you, first of all, some liquidity you can guard. In order to guard your liquidity, you have to know who the enemy is. And the number one enemy of your liquidity is the U.S. government. The Congress has to find ways to pay the interest bill. And the only cash it's got available is yours. I believe it's very prudent uh, for anybody to have some surplus of food on hand. I mean, uh, the fact that you can walk down to the local grocery store and buy food doesn't mean that local grocery store won't run out of food. We are going to have to create our own jobs, create our own wealth. There will be an entire new uh, industry, an underground economy possibly, springing up everywhere. Anyone who can do anything that is of value to anyone else will be able to survive. Anyone who's just dependent on some large corporation for a job to move some numbers around in accounting or do this, some technical skill, is probably going to be out of work. This national indebtedness is really a national symptom of the attitudes that we Americans have come into personally, the personal attitudes we've come into about money, about property, about the lust after comfortable living being the, the driving force in American society for which we have to spend money to fund this kind of obsession. I know this is going to sound odd, but there's a sense in which this is not a fiscal problem, it's a spiritual problem. If a person can't stand to wait another day to get some material thing he wants, he's going to go in debt to get it. Our government has done it, and we've done it as individuals. There is a need for a spiritual revolution for the people of America to rediscover the Judeo-Christian roots on which the nation was founded. Because this runaway spending, this national debt, is, when you come down to it, is just a spiritual problem or a moral problem. Very simply, where do we who are living today get the moral authority to spend and consume and transfer to an unborn generation the duty of paying what we're consuming today? The reason that, that uh, the Bible, for example, emphatically rejects this kind of, of increasing debt as a lifestyle is that it creates, it fosters an attitude toward life that you can get something for nothing, that you don't have to be responsible. So the indebtedness is a symptom of a rejection of a responsible lifestyle, responsibility to God. It is part and parcel of our modern American rejection of a biblical way of life. When the American people abdicate their rights to their government, when they look to the government to solve the problem, when they don't address fundamental values, it begins in the home. It begins with the family and with the community. And we've gotten away from that. We've forgotten that God's blessed America and we've turned our backs on the kind of integrity he demands. There has been a moral inversion come to pass in America where the counterculture has become the culture, the establishment, and the established culture is now déclassé. It is, it is the counterculture. It has been deposed from the throne of, of moral, spiritual, political, epistemological control of the nation. As I look in the Bible, you don't see much reference to the United States in the last days. So we assume that we are either not dominant, or if so, we're merged into some other group. Biblically speaking, uh, I don't see the United States in Bible prophecy. Uh, I don't see a Western superpower either. Instead, I see a confederation of European nations, and that would take the demise of the United States. The USSR has fallen apart in a shambles much faster than anyone would have predicted. Never would have dreamed it would have fallen apart that fast. America is also in the decline. The void that's left by these two declines is being filled by Europe on the one hand and Asia on the other. Japan is shifting its investment from the West to China. That makes all the sense in the world. Combine the Japanese capital and uh, technology with China's raw materials and labor and you, you're going to spark the biggest economic revolution in recorded history. But the challenger to this will be Europe, not the U.S. And here in our lifetime we're hearing about a one world currency we hear about the New World Order governmentally, and uh, 
the whole thing is being set, the scenario is being set. In the last analysis, when a culture goes, then the night comes when no man can work. The Bible says evil men and seducers shall become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Bible does not promise some kind of instant economic recovery because of some spiritual formula, but the Bible says in the last days perilous time shall come. I believe that God is doing everything spiritually possible to awaken his people. And that if his people do not awaken, it's very possible that God will just turn his back and walk away from this nation and say, suffer whatever you have to suffer. Now, the best way to get the attention of God's people is persecution. We know that. During affluence, we have the tendency to forget about God. It is during difficulty that we come back to God. Instead of pointing the finger of blame or feeling hopeless, Christians should be the first to do everything possible to change the course of America's future. History has proven that people united in action can change a nation's destiny. But they also need to be prepared for the worst. The Bible confirms that the borrower will be the slave to the lender. Therefore, God's people must be committed to obtaining a debt-free lifestyle. In many cases, severe personal sacrifice will be necessary. Once their homes are in order, they should do everything possible to learn to make a living under adverse conditions and then share with others in need. As a body of Christ, our greatest asset is our numbers. And we ought to be working with each other to help each other. And that means start some plans, some programs within your local church. Take care of your own poor. Take care of the people that are out of work. Help them to get reemployed. Help them to buy gas for the car. Help them to keep their kids in school. Help them to be able to make the payments on their house, assuming that they're living by some kind of a, a reasonable budget. Those are the things that God calls us to do anyway. We don't have to wait for a crisis to do that. In fact, during a time of crisis, what we ought to do is draw together and literally become a family because that's what God says we are. And the local church ought to have a surplus of money and keep them from building a new building with it. Keep that surplus of money on hand to help the unemployed. You know, the, the command to Joshua to choose you this day who you will serve, that's going to be the call to the church of Jesus Christ. Who will we serve, even when it's dark outside? And hey, uh, we've got to teach our people that we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, before whom one day we will give an account. The beautiful effect is that man's importunity is God's opportunity. A guy that used to have a lot of money and all that it would buy who is now broke, it may just occur to him that it's time to pray to seek the Lord, and if he does that, then the equation is entirely different. Put God into the equation, anything is possible. Without him, in the last analysis, nothing really is that matters.